Greetings, welcome. I'm Beth Pollard, professor of history and founding co-director of SDSU Center for Comic Studies. And on behalf of myself and Pam Jackson right there, uh, comic arts curator in special collections and university archives and the other founding co-director of the Center for Comic Studies, we want to thank you for joining us for this gathering, both in person and for those of you who are watching this after the fact um, on a Zoom recording. Uh, we have a lot of people to thank uh, for our event. Uh, we are generously supported by the College of Arts and Letters, uh, the College of the Library, the President's Big Idea Initiative, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, so we have a lot of people helping us out. And with that help, the Center for Comic Studies has been building the comics collection um, that's Pam's, uh, Pam's thing, uh, developing the comics curriculum, promoting critical comic studies, fostering connections with the comics community in San Diego, and hosting events such as the one we're going to have here today. Uh, if you haven't already, we encourage you to take a look at the center's website, which is aptly located at comics.sdsu.edu, and that has a lot of information about what we're doing. Uh, in fact, if you take a peek at the events tab, you'll be able to see that we have another set of talks coming up right after spring break. Uh, in this very room on April 4th, we'll gather here for Professor Carolyn Coca, uh, who will be joining us from SUNY Old Westbury to talk about strong, sexy, singular stereotypes, the power and problem of superhero stories. Uh, which draws on her Eisner award-winning book, Superwomen, Gender, Power, and Representation. So I hope we see some of you here for that. But to today's main event, it is Professor David Lewis who brings us together today. Uh, Dr. Lewis is the Eisner Award-nominated author of American Comics, Religion and Literary Theory, The Superhero Afterlife as well as co-editor of both Graven Images, Religion in Comic Books and Graphic Novels, as well as Muslim Superheroes, Comics, Islam, and Representation. Uh, Dr. Lewis doesn't just study comics and graphic novels, not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, but he also creates them. Uh, he's the acclaimed author of comics uh, such as The Lone and Level Sands and Kismet, Man of Fate. He's also working right now on a graphic adaptation of Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, which will be hitting press this summer. I hear you can get it in June, right? June, 2023. Uh, Dr. Lewis is currently assistant professor of English and health humanities at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, where his teaching and research focus on graphic medicine which is what we're here for, uh, specifically the depiction of cancer in comic books and graphic novels. And this year, he is serving as a prestigious Eisner judge, which means we have probably, uh, we're lucky to have caught him in between the 20 graphic novels that he needs to read this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so we're glad that um, uh, that you were able to take a break from all of those. In fact, uh, at lunch today, he was delivered a giant bag full of about. Did you even look in it? Was there about twenty? Oh, so that's all. So it wasn't twenty. Uh, yeah. So, but today, in his break between reading graphic novels uh, and comics, uh, Professor Lewis shares with us his talk entitled "Graphic Medicine in 2023." Please join me in welcoming Professor Lewis. Uh, thank you very much. My thanks, of course, to the Center for Comic Studies for having me here today. My thanks to Beth Pollard and to also Pam Jackson uh, for being such excellent hosts. What we call graphic medicine may have existed for some time. It may be ancient, the use of sequential images and words to detail or instruct some medical procedure, illness, or state of health. Image and word were being amalgamated, hybridized, to serve human health before we had a fixed name for it. Medical illustration, art therapy, graphic pathography, healthcare comics, patient art, instructional diagrams, maps, 
thanks in no small part to Dr. Ian Williams in 2007, recognizing that we needed a coherent term under which to capture all this, we arrive at graphic medicine. It does not stand alone, of course. Graphic medicine places itself at the overlap of many different spheres, from narrative medicine to disability studies to quality management and healthcare to media studies. But the place our discussion begins to give us both the necessary terminology as well as a sense of the progress made over the past 30 years at least is in comic studies. There is no formal start date as to when comic studies began. As Scott M. Smith notes in his chapter of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, comics slid their way into academia gradually, though his late 80s estimate of their becoming visible and viable enterprise on campuses overlooks even earlier work like Umberto Echo's The Myth of Superman in 1972, or Ray Brown's founding of the Department of Popular Culture at Bowling Green State University that same year. Certainly, by the 1990s, comic studies had taken form, thanks in no small part to books like R.C. Harvey's The Art of the Comic Book, M. Thomas Inge's Comics as Culture, and vitally, Scott McCloud's hit primer, understanding comics. In his 2005 TED Talk, McLeod reflected on comics evolution, tracking and attempting to predict its further durable mutation. Do smartphones take something away from the experience of reading a comic, or do they liberate it from something that had been holding them back? Is the optimal comics experience achieved with the newspaper broadsheet? a stack of floppy staple bound issues or an expertly bound bookshelf collection. McLeod's search for durable mutations of the comics medium could also be extended to the growth of its genres. War comics, for instance, have ebbed and flowed in popularity while horror comics have always maintained a subtle steady presence. The crime genre has peaked at times and the funny animal genre will always find a market with children. And of course, there's the superhero, though not always as commercially superhuman as one might think. Autobiography, adaptations, high fantasy, romance, and sci-fi are genres that cross media, but in terms of comic solely, graphic medicine has become its own manner of durable mutation a compelling cross-reference with potential subgenres, including graphic pathographies of cancer or clinical memoirs. If comics is the medium, graphic medicine is nearly everything else. Note the authors of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto. Among them, quote, it's an approach to the education of health professionals, as well as an emerging area of interdisciplinary study. And it's more than this. Graphic medicine is also a movement for change that challenges the dominant methods of scholarship in healthcare, offering a more inclusive perspective of medicine, illness, disability, caregiving, and being cared for. The fact that they call their work a manifesto is a testament to graphic medicine being, among other things, a movement. So, of the many things it can be, all across various nations, is graphic medicine a field, a genre, a method, a tool? The answer can be yes to any of these, so it's important that we call out the way in which we mean it in context. As a subject of study, it can be considered a field, an area of education and content with certain theoretical or real world applications. One might argue that it's a subfield of comic studies, of narrative medicine, of any of the disciplines listed previously. But that largely depends on one's area of expertise and their immediate goals for the scholarship. When we do apply it in the real world, such as a clinical or outpatient setting, what we are studying here becomes a method, a way in which to engage with healthcare in general or a patient's health specifically. 
Further, if we prescribe some aspect of graphic medicine, encouraging someone to create their own or introducing them to a particular publication, then we might see it as more of a tool or a treatment. This could also be a tool for healthcare workers to use as much on themselves or their organization as someone they are treating. If graphic medicine is a genre, however, that means that the works applicable to it share certain conventions or elements. Therein lies the challenge. That is, a majority of the works of graphic medicine are narratives, either fiction or nonfiction, and sometimes both. But a few are distinctly non-narrative, expressing sensations and feelings rather than stories. There's no set length to a piece of graphic medicine, and there is no limit to the time period. With the exception of it being visual, McLeod recognizes how comics mimic all five senses through vision alone, there's no limit on style or form. And the target market, the intended audience, and the reach of a work can be anything, anyone, and any amount, anywhere. As I explore with my colleagues, graphic medicine has such a wide scope that forcing a single label or inherent characteristic on it may do us ultimately a disservice. However, let's explore just for the moment, namely the power of comics highlighted by the editors of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto. Smith ends his chapter with an excerpt from Nate Powell's Swallow Me Whole sharing it and in turn inviting the reader to both interpretation and empathy. That is a key strength of comics in general and perhaps the core element of graphic medicine. Comics give voice to those who are often not heard. The irony here is intentional that a silent medium and invisible art would be discussed in terms of hearing, but this metaphorical hearing is what allows us to absorb these experiences, these instructions, these sensations, and these pains within ourselves. Reviewing an array of titles that would qualify as graphic medicine for the journal Literature and Medicine in 2007, Hilary Chute says, in this newly recognized form, words and pictures can create a literary and effective register that powerfully represents stories of illness that people want to see and to read. Graphic medicine presents us with the voices in healthcare we need to hear as well. Just as it has a range of legitimate definitions, graphic medicine has also has no one sole origin point. However, perhaps its fullest first expression, an entire comic dedicated to the symptoms and suffering of its creator, a personal case study in comics form was by Justin Green with his Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary. This account, of living with OCD before it was ever diagnosed, sets an early standard for the autobi autobiography, both in graphic medicine and in the comics medium overall. It is reported that without Green's Binky Brown, fellow underground cartoonist Art Spiegelman might not have gone ahead with his own revealing comic story, the Pulitzer Prize winning Mouse. As Williams writes in his article for the journal Medical Humanities, even now in an age when the causes of obsessive compulsive disorder are better understood, this comic book still works brilliantly as an example of what it is like to suffer the mental torments of the condition. Perhaps Green did it for personal catharsis. Perhaps he did it to chronicle his disability or to make sense of it. However, in laying out the narrative of his suffering, Green has become an example of what Arthur Frank calls the wounded storyteller, one who has lived through a profound experience and by relating the story to others has the ability to heal. Williams knows of what he speaks, not only as a physician and early scholar of graphic medicine, but also as a comics creator. 
in The Bad Doctor, The Troubled Life and Times of Ewan James, Dr. Williams brings audiences into both the clinical practice and mental life of Dr. James. The Cardiff physician sees any number of Frank's wounded individuals, some more sympathetic than others, even if as the doctor himself struggles with his own woes, his history of mental illness, his idling marriage, his difficult medical partner. Williams suggests that the wounded are not only all around us, they are us. And those wounds may contribute to who we are as much as who we are kept from being. When James questions whether he is a good or bad doctor, a friend helps him realize that the doubts which plague his personal life never extend to his work. He is a bad doctor only to himself which may in turn lead him to greater care and understanding, if not always empathy, for his patients. Where exactly Williams is in all of this, a Dr. Ian writing about a Dr. Ewan, one letter removed, cannot be said for certain, but he is at least acquainted with the dark side, the human side, to a physician's experience. Presumably a work of fiction, The Bad Doctor must contain at least traces of William's own life, just as Green's autobiographical struggles are refracted through the lens of Binky. One branch of literary theory posits that all narratives are in some way fictional. The very act of narrating historical or scientific material requires selectivity, subjectivity, and even inadvertent distortion. Therefore, part of the art of graphic medicine is negotiating the fictionality of narrative, utilizing its strengths and acknowledging its effects. Whereas Williams may be veiled in, behind, or beyond his character, M.K. Serwick, creator of Taking Turns, Stories from HIV AIDS Care Unit 371, and co-founder of the Graphic Medicine site, places as much of herself in this record of her first nursing job. There is no suggestion here that Serwick is anything other than genuine and forthcoming in her account for taking turns. But the work is as much an excavation as a chronicle, sifting through the past to make sense of a dire time in healthcare. For the sake of coherency, certain choices must be made. None of these are literal depictions of the moment, but instead better communicated and somehow truer through Serwick's careful choice of comics conventions. Even as she reveals a great deal about herself, Serwick also avoids saturating the book with her personal details and thereby diminishing the power of her message. Um, if jazz is about listening for the notes that aren't played, then comics can also be about what's not shown and not heard. In his chapter for the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, Michael Green, no relation to Justin, highlights a moment from the graphic memoir, Cancer Vixen, where the author, Marisa, and her mother cannot process the information that the doctor is conveying to them. The panel drives home, particularly to healthcare practitioners and those who have never faced the cancer experience, how facing such an experience can flood the senses and impact the psyche. Similarly, another portion of the book has the background missing entirely, filled instead with the looming presence of the word cancer suffusing everything for Marisa. The visuality of these two scenes may communicate to a reader what words could never convey. Williams emphasizes this point in his medical humanities piece. There is something about the juxtaposition of drawings and handwritten text in comics that subverts the normal rules about what can be depicted, how it can be described what one should think of that description and the suitable meanings and counter meanings that can be read into it. Laying out a proposition in text tends to require precise language if one is not to be accused of obfuscation. Comics, like poetry, 
seem to allow more leeway in terms of meaning. And like film, offered the possibility of words juxtaposed with a contradictory image. In prose, writers certainly have a range of rhetorical devices available, but the number of possible strategies in comics is multiplied. Ambiguity and metaphor can be layered, bestowing properties that seem to lend comics to the portrayal of complex or taboo narrative, where language is lacking to describe bodily sensations or complex emotional states, Metaphor can play a vital role in communication. Comics's language is always characterized by a plurality of messages. Parsing all that ambiguity, all those symbols and blank spaces requires the reader of graphic medicine to become more adept with multiplicity. One must absorb and process the material, thereby becoming what literary theorist Wolfgang Eser might call an essential cog in the meaning-making machine. Green observes, I think what's really happening and interesting about comics in the medical context is that it's a medium that requires people to be active participants rather than passive recipients of information. Williams and Serwick are having us read absence as much as presence, context as well as content. To some degree, this is McLeod's closure across panels and over blank gutters, the space that asks, and then what? To another degree, this is R.C. Harvey's interplay between word and image as one affects and sometimes becomes the other. And on a higher level, it's all these things, the mental activity required either in creating or in understanding a simple comic book. So why expend such effort? And why then go back to study such works, consider their deployment in healthcare as graphic medicine? Because the dividends are potentially so massive. Serwick considers works of graphic medicine tremendous windows into the lived embodied experiences of illness, an access point unlike any other, as much for treating patients as for understanding humans. Green, too, echoes Williams' notion of the empathic bond such comics can create, giving all people, but particularly healthcare providers, a greater ability to relate. To understand what someone like Justin Green was suffering, rather than writing him off as a pervert, a freak, a broken person, may require more than the passive reading of a case study or a rote taking of a patient history. Graphic medicine subscribes to the idea that it requires the full absorption of word, of image, of sequence, and of silence to connect across boundaries. In a shipyard where they construct and repair and repurpose vessels of all sizes and shapes, a remarkable array of specialties and fields of expertise work together toward a common goal. Uh, crane operators, Welders and engineers combine with chemists, accountants, security, IT, and military personnel to fashion ships capable of traversing every body of water known to our planet. It is an extraordinary undertaking, particularly because even as it produces tangible, visible results, a shipyard is no one thing. It requires no one skill set, but a myriad number of them. When considering an undertaking like graphic medicine, the principle remains the same. This field may draw most directly from comic studies, its welders and early engineers, perhaps. Moreover, we have our first generation who are native to graphic medicine, figuratively born on these docks and always having had a view of the horizon. But all of this would be a fruitless and altogether incomplete enterprise without the active influence of three affiliated fields that I'd like to highlight briefly. 
In her chapter, The Crayon Revolution for the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, M.K. Serwick makes a notable comment about her advocacy and self, uh, excuse me, her advocacy of self-portraiture by medical students. Having them use crayons, the great equalizer, Serwick allows them to access an innate visual language that they all already possess. It has been there since their childhood, since the time where supposed talent in terms of one's drawing did not matter, nor did how realistic a composition one could produce. I would actually say that good drawing is being able to create a drawing that expresses an emotion, one that people can read, understand what you are saying, and are moved by it. That ability still resides in nearly all of us, and it can be tapped through crayons and through comics, both an invisible art when described by theorists like McLeod, but also a medium of simplicity and efficient of form when employed this way by Serwick. The assignment for these medical students is often a revealing one, as they depict themselves voluntarily as being under immense stress or unmanageable expectations. This is where Serwick states, to be clear, this is not art therapy. It is image making that may indeed be therapeutic, but that is not the goal. This disentangling of graphic medicine's therapeutic value, but its distinction from art therapy also displays the tie between the two fields, namely the empirical support that art therapy has merited and the standard to which graphic medicine must hold itself. Devlin McCrate reminds us of this in his article for Counseling Today. Although interest regarding the intersection of health services delivery and comics is at an all-time high, empirical research regarding the efficacy of comic creation as a direct intervention is largely absent. This might dissuade practitioners from introducing comic making into their therapeutic work, but it is important to remember that every testable intervention begins with a theoretical question moves to the gathering of qualitative anecdotal evidence, and then transitions to quantitative outcome measures. Graphic medicine may not be art therapy, but it is certainly brethren to it. And hard data on graphic medicine's impact is growing annually in major medical journals. In addition to art therapy and application, graphic medicine also operates alongside the field of disability studies in context. In her legendary book, Illness as Metaphor, Susan Sontag observes, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to use the other passport, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. Some, of course, spend a lifetime in the night side of life, either as the result of an accident, a trauma, an illness, or their birth. In the case of Victor Stone, DC comic cyborg, the character is not only disabled due to a horrible accident, but is also located, according to Jonathan W. Gray, as a triple minority. Stone is black, post-human, and disabled, affecting a narrative stasis for the character and maintained tragic and pathologized view of disability that in the parlance of Jordan Peele's film Get Out makes the kingdom of the sick also Cyborg's sunken place. Even when narratively activated, Stone rarely enjoys the agency that his fellow superheroes, nearly all able-bodied, Caucasian-looking, and whole do. Robert Jones Jr.'s essay, Humanity Not Included, reads Cyborg as a gym to the childlike Shazam's Huck, or as the comic cosmic chauffeur to the rest of the Justice League. Cyborg serves in the racist mold of the buck. So of course he's an athlete, 
Of course he plays football. White supremacy must always find some productive use in black bodies, must always be able to capitalize off our labor. Oftentimes, when white writers are attempting to write black characters, they rely on stereotypes because they can't imagine black people as actual human beings. Notably, the superhero genre itself is relatively dismissive of the human being overall, even before engaging in issues of race or disability. Jose Alanis, in his book, Death, Disability, and the Superhero, characterizes the genre as having an utter intolerance to death, not only fighting against mortality, but also recovering from it and even transcending it, when very rarely a superhero actually succumbed to death, it had to be done in a heroic manner. Their deaths not only had to mean something, they had to accomplish something. Alanis points out only a handful of superhero deaths that are what he call existential deaths, deaths which mean nothing and accomplish nothing. Even with the few existential deaths Alanis recounts in his chapter, most are women, along with young boys, a dwarf, and a black man. This is to suggest that death, particularly a permanent and meaningless one, is troublingly framed as non-normative in the superhero genre, as something not directly applicable to white, male, able-bodied models. Uh, this actually is what makes Jim Starlin's The Death of Captain Marvel such a fascinating and notable case for graphic medicine, both in terms of the depiction of cancer and in terms of the superhero genre. I'll touch on that again in just a moment. Along with art therapy and disability studies, we might consider a third associated discipline, namely narrative medicine. To quote McCrate, there is a unique space created by comics to be utilized, as we have seen by art therapy and disability studies, by mental health clients and patients, especially in safely capturing their experiences. The idea of containment is extremely important when dealing with sensitive parts of a client's experience. Each panel in the comic sequence functions as a figurative container for potentially overwhelming psychic material, allowing clients to approach the issue with a feeling of control or mastery that might elude them otherwise. The comic format allows clients to represent themselves, others, and even their disorders pictorially through the creation of avatars. McCrite highlights the work being done by DARPA to aid combat veterans with PTSD. Comics allow them to detail their experiences and their sensations without necessarily inhabiting them. They can process and find meaning in it while at the same time safely externalizing it. When discussing narrative medicine's overall capacity to uncover trends, themes, and connections in patient stories, Dr. Shannon Wooden points to her experience with one patient's resistance towards hospice care. Employing the tools of narrative medicine, of narrative knowledge, she could determine that all of his stories were about power. As with the veterans, sensitivity to a narrative channel allows for greater insights on the part of the healthcare practitioner. Presumably, Dr. Wooden's team could communicate the benefits and needs of hospice care without sacrificing the patient's concern for personal agency and control. Quoting Columbia University's Rita Charon, Serwick identifies the shared mission of graphic medicine and narrative medicine with medical professionals to enable them to recognize more fully what their patients endure and to examine explicitly their own journeys through medicine. Charon, herself a physician, executive director of the program in narrative medicine at Columbia, advises medical students to keep a parallel chart of patient stories and metaphors alongside their medical chart. And her book, Narrative Medicine, details how such an instrument can be maintained. 
Now, in terms of graphic medicine, Serwick further offers that either a parallel chart or the creation of one's own comics allows practitioners and students a greater ability to reflect on the many potential roles as outside observer, as patient, as medical practitioner, as family present to the encounter. Graphic medicine does not spring out of art therapy, disability studies, or narrative medicine whole cloth. These disciplines can be more readily seen as crops grown in the same fertile field, as all different sort of machinist and nautical tools in the same shipyard, a linked ecosystem or one immense operation. Choose the metaphor most suitable to you. Early in her book, Sharon discusses accepting the mythic register of her family name. Sharon being a grave name for a doctor, recalling Charon the boatman in Greek mythology who ferries the dead across the river Styx to Hades. In time, she came to see her name in a new light, finding that Charon's task is ours, to know as best we can how to navigate that journey, how to recognize that shore. With Charon's mission in mind then, I'm inclined to disagree with the characterization of graphic medicine as another part of a doctor's toolkit, or even as Serwick aptly puts it, as a window. Graphic medicine, to me, is the boat. Whether it's Charon's vessel, a vehicle for enhanced mobility, or a beautiful construction, Graphic medicine is the craft that can accommodate so many of us, passports in hand, on its deck, and so many distinct versions of us as well. Surwick is right in that as a medium, comics are simple and efficient, thereby leaving room for all manner of passengers, including one's own multiplicity of selves and roles. But how far can graphic medicine go? Uh, personally, I would not know about Graves' disease if it weren't for the Nib comic by Aubrey Hirsch. I might have become aware of it if one of my own loved ones were diagnosed with it, or if some celebrity had it, or if a large ad campaign were produced to raise awareness about it. And even then, though, how deep into it would I go, really? How much of it would I absorb? Yet Hirsch's story, her comic, Medicine's Woman Problem, not only delivered essential information about Graves' disease, its symptoms, its risks, and its treatments to me, but it also did so in a manner that caused me to be invested. I saw its effects on her, and I witnessed the numerous and disturbing responses she received to her plight. Had she written it slow, excuse me, had she written it solely in prose, would I have read it? Moreover, would I have connected in any way with it? As with the best of graphic medicine, her comic both simplified and augmented. Great emphasis is given to how comics can be more easily accessed by children, by non-native English speakers, by those at a low literacy level, all true. But the beauty of comics medium is also how simultaneously it can enrich a narrative and heighten its art. Too often, this second trait of the medium gets overlooked by news broadcasts or education classes. Comics elevating ability gets eschewed at times because it sounds diametrically opposed to its strength of simplicity. It seems a paradox. Whereas akin to its blending of word and image, its frozen yet flowing moments of sequence, this is the medium's magic. Graphic medicine reduces barriers. It raises the comprehension of content. It does both even as it lures its audience into performing mental gymnastics to orchestrate meaning. I have likened graphic medicine to the amplifier for silenced voices, to a window into doctor, patient, and family experiences, to a shipyard, to a farmland, to a riverboat in the land of the ill or the dying. 
Here, as we discuss graphic medicine's application in our world, I would suggest thinking of it as an escalator. Simple, steady, solitary steps, all linked together and invisibly mechanized to raise its passengers to a new level. There's even a handrail for the wobbly. What I like most about considering it as an escalator in this context is its two-way nature. That is, Kim R. Myers, in her chapter for the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, discusses the use of graphic pathography for medical students to better understand an illness or a patient. Yet, as her students read and analyzed Cancer Vixen, Myers herself was undergoing her own mammography poor needle biopsy and diagnosis of cancer, and Cancer Vixen was there for her too. A point of comparison and of warning, of sympathy and of readiness. Graphic medicine may be a teaching tool for medical students and healthcare professionals, but it can also serve as an early form of bibliotherapy for patients and for everyone else, potential patients, the escalator goes both ways. As graphic medicine grows as a genre for a hungry publishing industry, as a tool for healthcare educators, as a resource for patients, and as a public information source, as it is frequently on the nib or the graphic annals of medicine, it can also be used even more stealthfully. Consider the case of Lissa, a story about medical promise, friendship, and revolution. Its authors, Brown University's Shireen Hamdi and Coleman Nye, in tandem, attempt to interweave their research areas, Coleman on genetic risk for cancer and Hamdi on kidney failure and organ transplantation. Even as they work to translate it through the art of RISD colleagues, Sarula Bao, Carolyn Brewer, and Mark Parento. The Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design collaboration becomes a beautiful chimera in the sense that Lissa is a truly hybrid thing in content and in form, not a fantasy. That synthesis of scholars, artists, and pioneers is just as much about ethnography as post-colonial power, the Arab Spring, William, women's education, body perception, women's rights, familial relationships, technology, guerrilla art, radicalism, cancer narratives, loss, mourning, and hope. In Lissa, Anna and Layla strike up an unlikely friendship that crosses cultural, class, and religious divides as young girls in Cairo. Their relationship emerges despite the imbalance between Layla's native working class family serving Anna's oil executive father. Their bond becomes enduring as Anna's mother is diagnosed with battles and succumbs to breast cancer. Five years and thousands of miles later, Anna learns that she too may carry the hereditary cancer gene BRCA responsible for her mother's death. Meanwhile, Layla's family back in Egypt is faced with a decision about kidney transplantation for her ailing father, who due to his faith strongly opposes such a procedure. Yet Layla's hard-won education as a young doctor places her at a distance from her parents' traditional views, as well as Anna's own medical preferences. Their rapport is put to the test when these health crises reveal stark differences in their perspectives until the revolutionary unrest of the Arab Spring changes all their lives forever. The value of Lissa extends beyond its bringing anthropological research to life in comic form. Unquestionably, it artfully combines scholarly insights and accessible, visually rich, and subtly cunning storytelling to foster great understanding of global politics inequalities, and solidarity. And to boot, it features two fully realized female characters not only passing the Bechdel test with flying colors, but proving more real than even some memoirs protagonists. No, the greatest accomplishment is it's opening up a landscape that is rich for development. Hamdi, Nye, Bao, Brewer, and Parenteau demonstrate just how much can be blended together not into a mishmash, but instead into a coherent, 
compelling work and how universal the human experience can be, particularly in comics, with a focus on medical matters. Lissa should not only be read as the first in University of Toronto's ethnographic series, but more importantly, as a full expression of what graphic medicine can do, what it can be. It's magic. So far, I've been approaching graphic medicine along a few wide avenues, from its overt modern expression in the second half of the 20th century, from its connection to and roots in comic studies, to its relationship to other contemporary fields of study, and to its emerging applications in healthcare education and medical and psychological practice. I'd like to close with my own area of research, namely the portrayal of cancer and cancer narratives in works of graphic medicine. There is no textbook on what I call cancer comics, at least not yet. So for the purposes of having an organizing work around which to contextualize the discussion of cancer and its history, I utilize the Pulitzer Prize winning Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Of course, several other books such as Cancer Land, a medical memoir by David Scadden, or even a prose biography, When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanthi, also merit strong consideration as the backdrop for such an exploration. One of the reasons I like Mukherjee's book in the context of comics is the thought that the published comics medium and the modern treatment of cancer rose at approximately the same time. That is, Mukherjee recounts that President Ta Taft proposed a national laboratory dedicated to cancer research in 1910. And in 1920, freshman Senator Matthew Neely called for a $5 million reward for information leading to the arrest of cancer. By 1937, Neely, in returning to the Senate, pushed through a bill for the National Cancer Institute Act. Comic books and later graphic novels come out of this same moment in history, with many newspaper comic strips being collected into their own books circa approximately 1920 to 1930. Ultimately, readers wanted original content, not just repackaged reprints, and the comic book industry was born. By the 1970s, concurrent with the rise of underground comics, the full-length graphic novel likewise emerged. This was approximately the same moment as the National Cancer Act of 1971, with a critical increase in the magnitude and vigor of the nation's efforts in cancer research. Thus, contemporary cancer treatment and this American ninth art rose at a conspicuously similar time. That could easily be a coincidence, of course, and um, plenty of other media and medical advances could be roughly slotted into a parallel timeline. Instead, I read a number of other compelling overlaps between comics and cancer that suggest to me some sort of relationship, some symbiosis, which is fitting, given that the way Mukherjee describes cancer and the way a number of comics protagonists do closely echo each other. In his chapter of Black Color Without Boiling, Mukherjee explains, it lives desperately, inventively, fiercely, territorially, cannily, and defensively, at times as if teaching us how to survive. To confront cancers, to encounter a parallel species, one perhaps more adapted to survival than even we are. This image, of cancer as our desperate, malevolent, contemporary doppelganger is so haunting because it is at least partially true. A cancer cell is an astonishing perversion of a normal cell. It exploits the very features that make us successful as a species or organism. Mukherjee later adds, if we as a species are the ultimate product of Darwinian selection, then so too is this incredible disease that lurks within us. Such metaphorical seductions can carry us away, but they are unavoidable with a subject like cancer. In writing this book, I started off by imagining my project as a history of cancer. 
but it felt inexplicably as if I were writing not about something, but about someone. My subject daily morphed into something that resembled an individual. Cancer then is more us than other diseases perhaps. It is an overabundance and corruption of the cells which constitute us. It seeks the same sort of thriving in existence that we might, albeit without consciousness. It can be easy as outside readers to lose sight of this, wanting to cast cancer as the villain or neatly as the antagonist. Why not when it's killing the character or even the author themselves? Even in this, though, we talk about the subject of cancer as a person and an opponent. And in that, we are quietly acknowledging how it comes from within, how it is of us. And in as much as we might want to cast those fighting cancer as heroes, we can find an inversion of that scenario in a work like The Death of Captain Marvel. In it, a career superhero is made powerless in the face of cancer. Aliens, invaders, supervillains, monsters, mutants, they all tried, but none of them could kill me. I fought them all and I won. I survived. Who would have thought that in the end, it'd be my own body that would turn on me and do me in? Moreover, it will turn out to be the source of his superpowers, the negabands that prevent his colleagues from properly aiding him. In effect, it's his being a hero that is leading to his death. Do not mistake this as victim blaming. Understand it as how personal, how of the self cancer is as a disease. It taps very directly into our understanding of what makes one human, what borders there are to the self and how life is expected to function. In easily the most tragic, most gut-wrenching moment from Cancer Vixen, Marisa has to mourn the loss of a child she can now never have due to cancer treatment. Marisa may live, but this child of her imagination will not. The death of Captain Marvel, Cancer Vixen, Mom's Cancer by Brian Fias, Seeds by Ross McIntosh, Cancer Made Me a Shallower Person by Miriam Engelberg. These are but a few of the conspicuously not large number of cancer comic titles. Second, perhaps only to the mental health category, cancer is the most frequent subject of published graphic medicine titles. One reason may be what I've already suggested. The cancer, in addition to its prevalence as a cross-cultural and cross-generational illness, lays potentially within all of us, as it is our own cell-growing process gone awry. Second, the experience of having and fighting cancer lends itself to certain visual metaphors upon which many writers and artists seize. Some of the earliest writing on cancer, says Mukherjee, explained it in terms of excess and certain bodily humors and overabundance of black bile swamping a part of the body. It is not difficult to find visual expressions of drowning or being trapped in cancerous fluid across a number of these titles, such as Mom's Cancer and Cancer Vixen. In Marchetto's book, the flooding is comprised of Marisa's own tears. In fact, she accuses a reflection of herself for her current state. Whatever the cancer's origin, it seems, Marisa holds herself accountable, even if only briefly, for it. Mom's Cancer, Cancer Vixen, Terminally Illing by Kaylin Andrews, but surprisingly not the space adventures of Captain Marvel, all feature visually the metaphor of a black hole appearing in the lives of cancer patients. In fact, the darkness into which the title character of Mom's Cancer is shown submerged also resembles the dying protagonist of Neil Gaiman and David McKeon's Signal to Noise, or even the imagined void consuming the mother of I Kill Giants lead character. Blackness seems the default hue of cancer, and an eruption or an implosion in space is commonly its mark. However, how fitting a visual metaphor is a black hole for cancer when the former is something from which nothing, not even light, may escape, and cancer for some is. 
Certainly the experience of battling cancer may feel at times as hopeless as the event horizon of such a gravity well, but perhaps the black hole is better understood as a threshold to the unknown rather than to destruction. That would make the recurrent black hole metaphor more akin to its sci-fi usage, you know, a passage to another dimension, access point to time travel, etc., than its actual cosmic value. And this may in turn explain Captain Marvel's reluctance to utilize it, especially when the dying captain himself also either hallucinates or transcends to a space beyond the mortal frame. Another example is the very fact that Captain Marvel's cancer cannot be cured by super scientists, sorcerers, geniuses, and demigods. This helpfully underscores a further disconnect. And here is where the necessary suspension of disbelief required for the superhero genre begins to chafe. For a fictional plague, uh, for a super scientific contagion, they could find a cure. But superheroes cannot alter the basic reality of their readers. If cancer continues to exist in the audience's world, then it must continue to exist in the superheroes. In a sense, as Captain Marvel must shed his uniform in favor of a life support tunic, I'm afraid I've lost too much weight to look anything but silly in it. So too are superhero conventions beginning to break down in the story. This is not necessarily a weakness of the superhero genre, but a strength. It's willingness at times to let its own conventions revealingly crumble. I would posit, in fact, that the cancer narrative would break down in nearly any story model, and perhaps not as tellingly. This is not to suggest that the attempt is futile or in any way without value. These works, these cancer comics, offer amazing insight, empathy, and voice to their respective experiences. The only question I offer here is whether they are remarkable expressions, but not necessarily shaped narratives. They do not, in fact, fit most shared model of narrative in at least the US market. And in all fairness, they should not be expected to. I'll have more to say on this, on cancer comics squaring off against narrative imperialism, along with the utility and potential of cancer comics in my talk tomorrow. But let me conclude today by saying this concerning the whole of graphic medicine and whichever of my visual metaphors for it, the shipyard, abode, escalator, magic, works best for you. When accounting for its future, my colleagues Satharyaj Venkatesan and Anu Mary Peter outlined four approach approaches to graphic medicine. Graphic medicine as a disruptive movement, as an educational tool, as therapy, and as community formation. I think my talk has touched on all of these, at least in part, but I want to emphasize the last one, the approach in which, by virtue of your being here today, you're already a contributor. Graphic medicine is a global affair in England, France, South America, Spain, Japan, Germany, and more. There is a subtle network forming, an invisible one but we are becoming part of a shared worldwide system. I hesitate to call it an organization or association or group because those words not only sound too small, but also too hegemonic. Instead, I wanna reach back to pull a more archaic, more patriarchal world, word into our 2023 context and strip it of its older connotations. Gradually, those who study, produce, or use graphic medicine all across the world are becoming part of one global guild. At this exciting moment, this guild is open to all. No credentials required, no degree prerequisite. One need only interest in and excitement for the enterprise in order to take part. After you're sitting through my talk today, let me be the first to welcome you to the fold. I encourage you to add your experience, your part of the shipyard, your voice to our growing endeavor. I welcome you and I thank you.
Of course, bring on any questions. I will have a sip of water as you collect your questions. Do I have a favorite? Mm. That's painful. Sophie's choice, right? Um, well, I'll tell you that um, I discussed this with some people before um, the talk today. Uh, I originally come to this through religious studies, of all things. And what I kept running into in a number of my favorite comics in religious studies is they all had medical components. If you think about mouse, there's dysentery, there's PTSD, there's uh, malnutrition, all of these highly medicalized uh, themes. Um, and I found it most interesting in works where we have an extremely faithful person of any faith, uh, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, you name it. Um, I always found it compelling when they had to negotiate how they felt about medical science. So that's why Lissa, I think, stands out to me as a particularly strong case. Um, I will say that I think the work that I offer most readily to people, taking their first steps, checking it out for the first time, is probably uh, Brian Fias's mom's cancer, um, if only because it is written on such a human and accessible and even at times playful level. He, he likens his mom's uh, cancer treatment process to a board game or to uh, a game of operation. Uh, the board game operation that um, it makes it feel like something you can understand if you haven't been part of that process, or it's something that you recognize if you have been. So I'd say any of those three are our favored starting points. Yeah. I do. I think I think there are several reasons why comics tackle cancer most often, or vice versa, why cancer stories are brought to comics. Um, and and you're right uh, in what uh, you suggested that co that um, we do want to villainize cancer as just so awful having no redeeming qualities. Mukherjee does a nice job in reminding us that this villain is 99% us. Um, and maybe that shadow self, that dark self that's killing uh, the person becomes that more potent. One of the things I'll talk about in um, tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's speech, um, is how I also think comics as a form, as being a series of closed panels across which there are gaps, presents sort of a reassuring space against a disease that is breaking through all barriers, that is breaking through all borders and growing uncontrollably. It's like comics as a shape um, is what I call disoncological, um, that I don't think you get from film, that you have to passively sit there and receive, and I don't think you get necessarily from prose uh, that you have to parse. Uh, I think there is an affinity um, with mental health comics being the only other category for which there's a larger number of graphic medicine texts, uh, I think there's an affinity of the cancer experience that comics can uh, help capture, contain. Yeah. I'm thinking of other genres 
I, w I would point to my colleague's article on this. I'm really giving them short shrift by just grabbing their section titles. Uh, they, they do uh, elaborate on uh, particularly how graphic medicine relates to these. Um, I think when, especially in the area of therapy, uh, and this is one thing I wanted to add late into my talk, we do have more and more hard data quantifiable evidence that graphic medicine leads to superior medical outcomes or superior recovery times uh, or better care or uh, less cost in healthcare. So when we say therapy there, it's not in the really loose and freestyle, all that makes me feel better, that's a load off my mind, but actual therapy that leads to um, provable healing. Uh, and that might be one key way that, that, that it differs from memoir, which can be healing, but in that holistic sense, not in that uh, more quantifiable sense. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Oh, there's a parting gift. Are you sure we want to get this on record? Should I stop the recording? Okay. <clears throat> you don't know how tough it is to talk for 15 minutes until you do it. All right. So, well, we wanted to thank you very much, Professor Lewis, for coming to visit us. Thank you. Uh, we have this uh, gift. You have to open it. I shall. <laughs> a mug. I think I heard the pun. A mug shot. Uh. Yes, and so we want to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for allowing us to record this. Absolutely. For our colleagues who weren't able to be here today. And uh, just, uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Was wonderful.